coming the call to worship. It's in your bulletin and also on the screen above. It is Psalm 46, verses 1 through 11. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change, though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea. Though it's God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of the city, which shall not be moved. God will help it, help it at the dawn of the day. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. God's voice resounds, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. Grace the bow, shatters the spear, and burns the shields with fire. Be still, and know that I am God. I am exalted among the nations. I am exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts.
color for the still warm weather that's late into the fall, for those we love and those who love us, for our food, our clothing, our free land. We thank you that we can be a blessing to others through the World Communion Offering, that we can help train pastors and missionaries in parts of the world where we'll never go. We thank you that we can be a part of your work through our regular tithes and offerings. Bless you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. New Testament reading this morning is from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 8, and verse 13. And I'll show you this familiar to many of you. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I have nothing. I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. If there are tongues, they will be still. For there is knowledge, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. God speaks in his word to his people. Thank, Thank you, Lord, for your holy word. Amen. Will the children come forward for the children's message? around the city. 
not shoot bows up at the enemy, not charge, not um, try to bring ladders and climb it, but just march around it. The priests had trumpets in front, led the Ark of the Covenant, and they marched around the city. So they went back to camp. Can you picture being the enemy soldier and thinking, what are these crazy people doing? How is walking going to make us give up? Then they did it the next day, and the next day, and day four, and day five, and day six, and day seven seemed the craziest of all, all because they marched around the city seven times. Now, if you were getting ready to fight, you didn't want to get really tired. So you march around this great big city seven times before you attack them? But then just at the moment, the priests blew their trumpets, or however they sound, I can't make the ram's horn sound. And the people shouted, and God sent an earthquake and knocked the walls of Jericho. But the thing is, usually a circle kind of walls, if there's cracks, will fall out. Well, guess who is outside the walls? Joshua, God's people, would have fallen on them. God knocked the walls in. So that the enemy was defeated. Now they all did their part. Those that played the trumpets, the priests carrying the ark, the soldiers, the people back at the camp, working together. They were stronger, better, and united. Now, I'm learning something you only see anywhere a few times a year. Any idea why? A clergy robe that's been worn for <coughs> centuries after centuries and it's more normal, not super common always here in the U.S., but around the world is the normal thing. Well, I learned on special occasions. This is World Communion Sunday. This is when churches of all sorts of languages, churches in Sudan and Tibet and China and Malawi and Finland and Canada Argentina, all celebrate that we're one together in Jesus, even though we speak different languages, even though we um, have different types of worship services. In Africa, a lot of the churches are just under a great big, it's just a bunch of people under great big trees to provide shade without even a building. In um, were one together, just like Joshua and the people fought one together. And Caleb is actually, Joshua's, I call him sidekick because he goes to the superhero thing, but he actually does something amazing. At 80 years old, he goes and conquers a mountain of giants. He helps Joshua and the people all the way through the land. And then at 80 years old, he says, hey, that mountain hasn't been conquered yet. Can I have it? And Joshua's like, well, it's full of giants. And he's like, well, yeah. The bigger they are, the harder they fall. God will help me. So he rallies his family, his kids, his grandkids, his cousins, and they go tackle the mountain of giants. Not thinking like Peter and the giant bean stock, but like super great big people. Like a mega football player kind of giants. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you caused God's people to work together at the promised land, that those who already had their homes still came and helped, that the people did their parts with the trumpets and the Ark of the Covenant and the shouting and the victory and the feeding. We thank you that as Christians around the world, we work together to be the body of Christ, loving each other and loving our broken world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, this is the Children's Church. <laughs> <laughs>
Whitney Schwartz, if you notice, has been here the last two weeks and has been doing some better. She's quite ill again. She's not in the hospital, but um, but she got bad in the night. So um, please keep her in prayer. Other joy or concerns? on hope. She is gaining weight, but she still gets, yeah, she cleared up and did have a lot of blisters, and all of a sudden she has all sorts of blisters. But she's getting more mobile. <coughs> she can roll over and stuff, but it's just causing, causing that agitation of, of her skin and making the John actually apologized for not having a prepared message. I, I gave one of the best messages I think I've ever heard. <laughs> so he um, just didn't have it all documented on PowerPoint. It was from the heart. Um, the season of the kids with kids club, deceased. Just so much of God's moving and God's goodness in so many areas. That's a wonderful joy. Let's bow our heads and our hearts before our Father's throne. Our wonderful Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you are. That when everything else fails, you are God. And God alone, our rock, our fortress, our deliverer. The God who is greater than our sickness, greater than our struggles, greater than our circumstances, greater than our sins. Lord, we thank you that we are a part of your body here in this community and around your world. And on this day, we as believers remember that you who unite us is so much greater than anything and anyone 
could ever divide or differentiate us. Lord, you know the requests that were lifted. You know the details on each one. Lord, as they come before our minds, may we lay them down before your still, before your blood stained, blood soaked over the cross. We ask you to be with us and in us and through us. We pray this in the name of your Son Jesus, who taught his disciples to pray, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. And this morning it is from Luke chapter 22, verses 14 through 20. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, may it your Son in the gospel.
Am I being heard all right? World Communion Sunday is when Christians around the world, we remember that the one who unites us is greater than anything that divides us. Our October memory verse is included as part of this scripture. This is Jesus, the night of the Last Supper, praying for his disciples. But then in verse 20, he begins to pray for us. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you have sent me, and have loved them, even as you have loved me. Do I need to switch to this? I'm not going real bad out here. I don't have a volume control. Oh, okay. Am I still at No. Okay, and I don't know if you guys could hear the echo or if it was just me, and I'm sorry, but... The um, communion feast has its roots in the Jewish Passover. After Joseph brought his father and brothers and their families into Egypt for safety during the famine. They stayed. And for a while, as Joseph was remembered and celebrated, they grew and were blessed. But then came a new Egyptian dynasty that did not know and remember Joseph and enslaved the people. And Pharaoh began to oppress the people to the point where he even ordered all the Jewish boys thrown into the Nile, to the crocodiles, because he was afraid they were multiplying and strong. They built some of the pyramids. They cried out for deliverance. God heard their prayer, but generation after generation, God had not yet moved. God sent Moses. The same Moses who stood in the desert and said, Here am I, send somebody else. Obeyed and went. And for ten plagues, nine times he went to Pharaoh, Let my people go, thus saith the Lord. Nine times Pharaoh said no. Nine times God brought increasingly severe plagues, each one showing God's power over the Egyptian gods, the god of the Nile, the gods of the frogs, the gods, one after another. Until finally, the horrible tenth plague. Moses appeared before Pharaoh and said, Thus saith the Lord, let my people go. Pharaoh said, No. Moses said, Then God's going to send the death angel, the firstborn male of every household, including yours. How would you like to be Pharaoh's son, who was undoubtedly sitting right there in the court? And seen nine times Pharaoh got warned, and nine times it came true. And now Moses is saying, you're going to die. That every one will be, the firstborn male in every household, from the least to the greatest, will be destroyed. But as always, God is merciful, and God had a way and a plan of escape. God also, through Moses, warned, and this was very publicly known, that if they would take the lamb, when they would sacrifice a lamb and put blood on the doorpost, that would be a sign that they believed that they were trusting in God, and God would tell the death angel to skip that house to pass over that house. 
The Jewish people to this day, thousands of years later, still celebrate Passover. From the, the second scripture that was read, Jesus told his disciples how eagerly he longed to celebrate this Passover with them. The original Passover, the blood of a lamb marked the doorpost that the angel of death knew these people trusted in God and skipped and passed over their house. In the Passover of Jesus, the blood of the Lamb of God, Son of God, the way, the truth, and the life, marks our heart. That on the day of judgment, when we stand before God, God's judgment will pass over us, and we will enter into eternal life in heaven. I could do a three or four hour sermon easily. Just the symbolism, time in the Old and New Testament, the, the image of the blood sacrifices of the lambs through Jesus, the Son of God, Savior. But obviously, I would be here alone at the end of three hours. <laughs> <laughs> so I will just touch on it there. On that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals. I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be assigned to you in the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. This day you are to commemorate for the generations to come. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, a lasting ordinance. Jesus, on the night of the Last Supper, said, Do this in remembrance of me. As often as you get together, do this in remembrance of me. <laughs> Remember my body broken, my blood shed. The reminder that in this world we will have trouble. But take heart, Jesus has overcome the world. That we are not forgotten, we are not forsaken. We don't walk alone or afraid. When the hour came, this is what you've already heard, right? Jesus and his apostles signed at the table. And I'm jumping down to 18b. Then he took the bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This is the cup in the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. In the body of Christ, Christ is the head of the body. We all together form the body. One, God has wired you to do things and reach people that he hasn't wired anyone else the same way. I am praying that whoever God has wired of you to stand up and lead the singing will do it. That's been my prayer for 15 months. Because any of you enthusiastic for leading the singing would probably be better than me. But until you who are wired answer the call, I'm not designed that way without filling the gap. You are the only Bible they will ever read. And that you need to be the hands and feet. has met me, but he'll, he'll hear John out. John, and to him. One of the saddest parts of the Christian faith is that so often throughout history, we as Christians don't always live the way we should. Now there are some honest differences of opinions and ways that sometimes it works better for churches to do their own thing. But so many times, divisions in a 
congregation in the body of Christ end up being more about personality or style or having their own way. When I was in my first pastor in Iowa, there were two churches that split off of each other. One insisted community leavened bread, one insisted the unleavened bread. For the first six months after they split, they put ads in the paper every week attacking each other on why the other one was wrong. And then after that, they sent their ads in the paper attacking the rest of us. This week was why the Methodists were wrong. This week why the Baptists were wrong. This week. That does no good. The body of Christ is bigger than our preferences. I really don't like wearing a clergy collar. And very rarely did until recently. A young late 20s pastor in Huntington challenged me. He started wearing it in public. He's the kind of pastor, he was a shorts and t-shirt kind of pastor, preaching shorts and t-shirt. And then he did a prison thing, and on his way back from the prison, he stopped somewhere in the clergy collar, and person after person asked him to pray. And I discovered that. To most people, it doesn't mean Catholic or Protestant. And this is a Protestant color, you know, the difference is white, not black is white, but that doesn't really matter. But I stopped at Walmart and had six people ask me to pray. My preference would be to wear the shorts and the t-shirt. God's increasingly tugging on me to show because to most people, they seem to see this as an invitation to pray. Especially people who don't have any church background. The worst fight I ever experienced as a pastor was in a church <coughs> over the color of paint. It was two groups of ladies, and I could not tell. I don't see shades real well. They were both a white and off-white. I could not tell the difference between the two colors. There was a six-month war with complete with screaming matches, complete with more than a dozen people leaving the church over. Because it became bigger than the pain. It was that I want my way. Oh yeah, well, I've been here longer, I should get my way. Oh yeah, well, I, my house is a lot more tasteful than yours. Uh, you know, just those kind of, and the horrible brokenness. What we offer, and when we offer it. Sometimes we have to look at the big picture. You will remember I asked a little survey sheet asking the best time for Bible study. The overwhelming best time was the same time as youth group. But I feel like, well, John and Sarah lead, I feel like I need to be available as a support, as an extra, as one of them. And so, um, Sometimes the needs of one thing um, take precedent. And so we're, we're, we're having Bible study Thursday at 11.30 and Thursday at 6.30 instead of the Wednesday at 6.30 that was, the, was requested. I just ask people any time, and that just happened to be the most common. But sometimes, and again, no one here has complained and if they had, I would be using it as an example. But sometimes, we have to be willing to sacrifice what works best for us, for what works best in the body of Christ. <clears throat> Music styles. One of the most impressive things I ever saw was in serving one church that the congregation was elderly, but a whole bunch of people in their 20s had moved into town. The town had a total demographic shift. And a, a group that loved the old hymns came to me and said, Pastor, we love this music, but we want to try some of the new stuff and see if it doesn't reach some of our neighbors. And it did. I'm not suggesting that in all other places or even most other places. But what impressed my heart was ended up with a mixture. But what impressed my heart more than anything else was their willingness to give up what was precious to them just to try something so that others might come to Jesus. 
Now pastors who had dummy thermostats installed in the church or trustees. Some are always hot, some are always cold, and that way people can play with it to their heart's content. And we have a lock on ours, I said. <laughs> but um, one of the things I love about this church is the overwhelming attitude of servanthood. That we serve, we love. I have, if it happens, I have not seen it, you're fooling me well. I don't see people fighting for their will and their way. And I'm amazed at the body of Christ broken in love. Will we serve Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sins and seek to live in love with one another. But we don't always, we fall short. Let's confess our sins before God and each other. Merciful God, we confess that we have failed to be an obedient Christian and an obedient church. We've not done your will. We've broken your law. We've rebelled against your love. We've not heard the cry of the needy, the lost, the broken. Forgive us, not for our own sake, but for the sake of your son, Jesus. May we die to self and live for you. That the love of Jesus may be lifted up in unity and forgiveness and servanthood. Lord, in the moment of silence which follows, if we have anyone we need to forgive, may we forgive them. If we have any sin to confess, Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were still sinners, proving God's love toward us. In the name of and because of Jesus Christ, you and I are forgiven. In the Methodist tradition, we celebrate the open table. We need not be a member of this or any church, only seeking, only right, or seeking to be made right with God through his son, Jesus. On the night he was betrayed, the night before he gave himself up for us, he took the bread, broke it, gave thanks for it, and said, This is my body broken for you. His body would be broken on an old rugged cross. Later that night, he gave the cup. This is my blood, the blood of the new covenant, poured out for the remission and forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. O oh Lord, though we're not worthy to receive you, say the word that we may be healed and saved and transformed. Make for us the bread, the juice, be the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Will our servers come forward? Body of Christ broken for you.
we can come to anyone that you can see it this way if you would, come through the center aisle and clear our leaves. And now the go for rails are always open as a place to give God more of you.
it and proved it in your broken body and blood shed. Go with us as we leave this place and into our time of serving your world. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.